and Keir yeah. Starmer facing questions over his stance on Gaza. There's going to be a crucial Commons vote this week on an immediate ceasefire that could potentially reignite divisions within the Labour Party. Now, speaking at the Scottish Labour conference yesterday, Starmer called for a ceasefire that lasts, check this out, but stop short of saying it should happen immediately. Here's what he had to say. I have just returned from the Munich Security Conference, where every conversation I had came back to the situation in Israel and Gaza. And the question of what we can do practically to deliver what we all want to see, a return of all the hostages taken on October the 7th, an end to the killing of innocent Palestinians, a huge scaling up of humanitarian relief and an end to the fighting. Well, joining us to discuss this in more detail is columnist at The Sun, Rod Little. Uh, Rod, a very good morning to you. Um, look, Keir Starmer had a pretty good end to last week, yeah. uh, winning those two by-elections, but the start of the week was very turbulent. Questions about how he's going to handle uh, anti-Semitism in the party. And this week is also going to be challenging for him. How do you think he's going to navigate this vote on Wednesday? Well, he started... Um doing exactly what one expected him to do, which is to row back on Israel and to change his mind. And um, the reason he's doing that is partly because he changes his mind on every subject anyway, but also because given his problems uh, with uh, pro-Muslim, uh, pro-Hamas, uh, pro-terrorist supporters in his own party, he couldn't maintain the line uh, of not calling for a ceasefire indefinitely. You simply couldn't, because more and more quotes like those which we saw from uh, the Labour candidate in Rochdale, Azhar Ali, would come out. Um, uh, so, so he had to do something, and this is what he's done. He's, he's decided that, uh, right, OK, let's call for a ceasefire. Uh, I think... Sorry, go on. Uh, go on I was going to say, welcome, my friend. I hope you're OK. I, I just want yeah. us to try and explain to people why such a, a, a lot of fuss is being made about words. We talked about this starting at 6 o'clock this morning. He says, what did he say, a ceasefire now? What, what, but he didn't say one that... What were his exact words? No, it, it was a ceasefire, a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, but not necessarily now. An immediate one, yeah. And, and also, Rob, my point is, and I made this earlier, and I'd love your take on this, and I got slaughtered by one person and agreed with by another. Benjamin Netanyahu is not even listening to America. Hamas is a terrorist organisation. Is actually some vote in Parliament relevant? Are we that relevant anymore? Does anybody... I'm being completely serious. Can, can a well, bunch of I politicians think... going, ooh, let's have a ceasefire now or next week, going to make any difference to the horrors we are watching unfold? Probably very little, except in one way, and that's that it, it, it's always occurred to me that uh, w with the uh, action in Gaza. Israel in the past has always been able to rely on its allies in the West. Right. Uh, much as it did during the Yom Kippur War, the, the, uh, uh, the war in 1967, it's always had a bedrock of support uh, amongst Western countries. And I think it's danger at the moment with Gaza is that it is losing that bedrock of support. Yeah. That, uh, that more and more Western countries particularly um, the, the equivocal idiots in France uh, and Germany, for example. Uh, but, but now it's Britain and America putting pressure on the Israelis. So they're in danger of losing their allies. And that, that, is, that is a real problem uh, for Benjamin Netanyahu, I think, even if our vote by itself doesn't make sure. much difference at all. I get that. I get that. I just wondered, you know, I, I look at the whole thing. I hate what I see. I don't think anybody with a brain yeah. cell and with any form of compassion can look at the horrors that are unfolding and not feel devastated about that. I will forever, because I have many Jewish friends, say that what happened on October the 7th was genocide and should never happen again. But, but I, I thought Jonathan Haslam made a really good point this morning when he said the focus is on Israel right now, and so it presumably should be because of what potentially could happen. But let's not forget that Hamas and their battalions are amongst these people doing their best to hide. So it, it, he says, oh, it takes both sides. I can't see both yes. sides sitting down to discuss it. That's my opinion. Well, well indeed, and it does take both sides. And, and for those uh, Hamas groupies in, in Great Britain, of which there are obviously many, as we see them on those marches, uh, 
asking for Hamas to give up the remaining hostages might not come amiss, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That, uh, and they never do. Uh, I mean, it, it's, there is such hypocrisy on the side of those people who support Hamas. Uh, and uh, but hypocrisy as well when they say that innocent civilians are being killed. Well, it's a war. That's, you know, that is tends to be what, what happens in a war, that innocent civilians are killed, whether it be the Second World War or, 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 the, or the war against Hamas. That tends to be what happens. Um, but, yeah, uh, I, th I, think, I think politically it's interesting, though, uh, because basically Starmer has got three or four months to sort out uh, a line on Israel that is acceptable to his uh, Hamas groupies in the party in momentum, uh, but it, which is also principled. And I don't know that he can do that. So I think you're going to see him moving further and further towards a position which is critical of Israel. Can we talk about a uh, different issue? Politics at home now. Front of many of the papers this morning yeah. are talking about this ban on, on mobile phones, which might be sort of clever politicking maybe from the Conservatives, because many head teachers will say, look, we've had the sort of ability to ban uh, mobile phones. But also others say, you know, it is about time that we should be better supported to say to kids, and this is only in kids in, in schools in England, um, we take your phone off you at, at the front door. You know, is that the right decision? Uh, I think I think what the government's doing is opportunistic and annoying. Uh, I've been involved in a, in a campaign to try and stop mobile phones in schools. Uh, in fact, there's a meeting in uh, in the House of Commons today about it uh, from a from an interested group. I I think without equivocation that uh, there should be no mobile phones. Uh, there should be no smartphones in any school in the country, up and down the country. None, nil, zero, and that should be statutory, and it shouldn't be the teacher's job to stop it. It should be a law. No kid. <laughs> I mean, I would go further and say that no kid under the age of 16 should have access to a smartphone. Uh, but certainly in schools, no phones whatsoever, apart from brick phones, which they can contact their mums and dads on uh, and maybe text their mums and dads. But Roddy, no access to Roddy I'm old fashioned. If you got sick or you needed your mum, you went to the school office. The fact of the matter is the other side of the coin. And we were talking about this earlier is high tech companies. There needs to yeah. be... It's very yeah. easy to say, oh, let's blame the government, let's blame the parents, let's blame the teachers. What about these high-tech companies who make millions and millions of pounds every day? Maybe there's an argument that says that they should bring in controls in these instances. That's the point. I'm, I'm sure that's right. And there's a very good book on the subject written by Yoan Harry, the, uh, the journalist Yoan Harry, called uh, Stolen Focus. The terrifying thing being that... Between the millennium generation and Generation Z, our concentration span has uh, has reduced by 50%, <laughs> you know, in one generation. And this is almost entirely a consequence of, of, uh, of smartphones, uh, that, that we're losing the ability to concentrate on anything. And this, of course, is vitally important in schools. Uh, I mean, you're right to blame the high-tech companies, but one can do that at the same time as saying, let's not have these phones in our schools at all. Uh, you know, we give these phones to children, not for their benefit, uh, but for our benefit, because uh, it keeps them quiet for a bit. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a form of neglect, I think. Uh, and feel, feel very strongly about this. I mean, well, the, the counter argument will be, and, and some people who've messaged in today and have made it today, to is to say, look, Phones are going to be part of teenagers' lives for the, for the rest of their lives. They've got to learn how to, to work with them. It's no, no good just saying, right, yeah, well, you know, removing your... You're to learn. Well, I'm, ju I'm just no, putting, they, putting the argument learn. that other yeah. parents have made this morning. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, yeah, but it's self-serving, I'm afraid, because they don't learn how to live with them. What they do is learn how to be addicted to them and never get off them. Uh, and th that, that's it, it's a real, real problem. It's a problem in terms of... Two things. Firstly, the, the concentration and, and detention spam, which I was talking about, but also, of course, because of the, the hundreds of thousands of kids who have mental health problems occasioned by the, the unpleasantness of social media, uh, and which is something we've seen rising and rising and rising over the last few years. Um, so the parents who moan about it, I'm sorry, you know, you give your kids smartphones, you do it not for their benefit, but for your own, to keep them quiet and occupied while you're ordering a meal in a restaurant or you've got the relatives around, you know, they sit there tapping their screens. It's, 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 no, it's no replacement for, for proper parental guidance and it's no, it's no uh, replacement for proper thought on behalf of the kids either. Uh, Rod, 11, listen, oh, I really appreciate you being on. Vote.
I appreciate you being yeah. on because you sound like you're full of cold, me old son. Dose up. I am a bit. I am a bit. Dose but, up. But, uh, 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 that, that lad is absolutely right. West Ham are totally pony and always have been. <laughs> I was going to say, rub Vic on your chest. Don't get down your nose. You won't speak. We love you, Rod Little. We'll see you next Monday. Thank yeah. you very much indeed.